I was a little rushed. I'll take your questions in a moment. Uh, the last thing I talked about was the cumulative distribution function, the CDF. And it was defined to be the sum. Well, actually, no, its definition is um, the probability that capital X is less than or equal to little x. And for a discrete random variable, sum of P of X sub I, such that all X sub I is less than or equal to X. So essentially, it's a, it's a, it's a cumulative sum. It's a sum of, all, for example, if I look at F of B, this is a less than or it's, a, it's all probabilities for which X is less than or equal to B. So numerically, let's suppose we look at the number line. And this is B. So F of B would be the probability, all the possible probabilities less than, less than B. So notice, in fact, I'll just show you the diagrammatically. Let's suppose this is B and this is A. So F of B would be the probability that X is less than or equal to B. Now I'm assuming A is smaller than B. So notice if we break up this entire piece, what do we get? Well, it's equal to the probability that X is less than or equal to a, that's this piece right here, including A, plus probability of, say, what is it? Um, this piece right here, excluding A, which is the probability that X is between, between a and B, including B. So notice what I have here. I have F of B is equal to F of A, by definition, that's what this is, plus the probability that X lies between A but not including A, because we already counted that in the previous piece, B, or we have the probability that A lies between that X lies between A and B, but not including A, to be just F of B minus F of A. Now, I, I state this because it's going to be slightly different when we learn about continuous distributions. Notice if I wanted to include A, then I would get F of B minus f of a plus the probability that x equals a. Now, when we learn about continuous distributions, which we haven't talked about yet, we're going to discover that this will be zero, this probability. The probability of a point for a continuous distribution is going to be zero. So the two results are really the same for a continuous distribution, but they're different for a, uh, for a discrete random variable. Okay, that was the last thing I did. Uh, were there any questions that anybody had about any homework exercises? Okay, well, yeah, let me just again remind you. So we, we've been talking about uh, um, a random variable, which we usually designate by X, capital X or capital Y or capital U or capital B, and in a special case, capital Z. Capital Z is usually reserved for the normal distribution but we have a notion of a random variable. Again, what a random variable does is, it, is it, 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 it looks at each sample point and associates a number with the sample point. So we want to build on that idea right now. So uh, to build on that, we want to talk about the notion of the expected value. Also called the expectation. So 
Don't say Paul Demi. So let me begin. I, I give a silly example, but to illustrate an idea um, is the following. Where's my uh, text here? Let's suppose a student takes um, uh, uh, is taking a course, and on the on the class exam, the student gets a grade. This is exactly the example from the text. A student scores an 84, an 81, and a 95. Uh, and so these are the in-class exams, grades. And the final, the student gets a 90. And let's suppose the final is counted twice in the average. So what grade do we expect the student to get? That's really the question. Well, uh, if this is the rule I've given you, then to determine the average, you take an 84 plus an 81 plus a 95, and the 90 counts twice, right? And we would divide this by five. So this would be his expected average. Or let's rewrite it as 84 times one fifth plus 81 times one fifth plus 95 times one fifth plus 90 times two fifths. Which by the way, uh, in case you're interested, is an 88 average. And this student would have gotten a B plus for the course. But that's incidental. So look at this uh, another way, okay? So what's happening is I have these payoffs say, the payoff sigma the payoff is being the grades. And I'm telling you how much each payoff is weighted. So each in-class exam was weighted one fifth. And the final exam was weighted two fifths. Now I can I can um I can rewrite this problem another way and say the following. Suppose I said, let's suppose. Uh, the probability that a student scores an 84 is a one-fifth. The probability that a student scores an 81 is one-fifth. The probability that a student scores a 95 is one-fifth. And the probability that a student scores a 90 is two-fifths. So then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, each of these payoffs is being weighted by one-fifth, except for the final, which is two-fifths. It's a weighted average. And by the way, notice nowhere did the student score an 88, but that's the grade assigned to the student. So the 88 is really nothing more than a weighted average of the other scores. And with this in mind, I can define what I mean by the expectation of a random variable. So let me give you a uh, definition and you'll see it makes totally good sense. Um, where to go? Uh, I bet you the same language I'm using in text. So let's suppose I'm given the random variable um, X, capital X. Uh, I'm assuming it's a discrete random variable uh, with range X1. X2, X to them, okay. And corresponding probabilities say we'll call it P1, P2, P3, and so on then we define the expected value of a random variable also called expectation also called the mean denoted by 
either e of x is one notation we use for it, or mu sub x to be um, x sub i t sub i over all possible i values. So I think I called it the, did I call it P sub i or did I call it P of x sub i? Or I might've called it P of x equal x sub i. So what's happening here is to find the, expect the expected value, I take, I take each range value and I weight it by its probability. Those things that have greater probability contribute more to the expected value. Uh, those that have smaller probability contribute uh, less. So the expected value, notice when, I, when, when it's understood that I'm talking about the random variable X, I'll leave out the subscript, is nothing more than uh, the weighted average of the range values where the weight is their probability. So um, let's look at a trivial example. Let's suppose I give you the following probability distribution. I take some of the value of, uh, I toss a coin three times, or I, okay, that's, and let's suppose the problem, and uh, X is the number of heads. So P of I will be what? This would be one eighth, this would be three eighths. We've done this example a number of times, one eighth. So here's my distribution. I'm, I'm tossing x is the uh, the number of heads that shows up. So what I'm asking here is, on the average, if you perform this experiment, you flip this coin three times. On the average, what do you expect to happen? How many heads do you expect to get? So e of x is the average number of heads you expect to get, and it's nothing more than the i values times their probabilities. And I do a quick computation and I get 1.5. Is that surprising? If I take a fair coin and flip a fair coin three times on average, how many heads do I expect to get? Well, if it's a fair coin, I would expect to get as many heads as I would tails. So the average would be 1.5. That seems to make a lot of sense. Now, Sometimes the expected value is actually a monetary payoff. That is, suppose you play a game. I don't, I don't really care what the game is. And suppose this game has the following distribution. If one event happened, it, uh, 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 let, let's just call up uh, here. Let's say it a little differently. Let's say the sample space has consists of two possibilities, S1, and S2. If S1 happens, there's a payoff. The payoff is $3. You win $3. And if S2 happens, what do I, what do I, you win, you lose $5. And let's suppose the corresponding probabilities are uh, four sevenths and three sevenths, okay? So here are my probabilities, here are my outcomes, and here are my payoffs, the x's. So for this experiment, it's, it will just be x1 times p1 plus x2 times p2, or the first payoff is $3 times four sevenths plus uh, minus five dollars times three sevenths, and as you work that out, another spam call. Let me just get rid of my spam call. 
if you work that out, uh, it turns out to be minus 43 cents about. Okay. Which by the way is exactly equal to minus three sevenths of a dollar. Everything's falling. My desk, you think my desk isn't big enough here. I have to turn it down here. Right. So now I'm going to change this problem a little bit, which is going to give us another interesting result. Okay. Suppose I change the rules of this game, okay? There's already, so it, this is some game of chance of some sort. And suppose I change the pet off. So the question is, uh, change the payoffs uniformly, meaning the same, So the payoff, so the expected value is zero. That's my question. Let's change the payoffs of this game so the expected value is zero. By the way, in a game of chance, the game is said to be fair if the expected value is zero. The game is said to be unfavorable to the player if the expected value is negative, and the game is said to be favorable to the player if the expected value is positive. Why? Because if it's positive, it means on the average, you're gonna win. That's in your favor. So let's look at this experiment one more time. We have the S1 and S2. And um, the probabilities were, what were they, uh, four sevenths, four sevenths and three sevenths. These are my probabilities. And now I want to change the payoffs. The payoffs, remember the X of I values were, uh, what were they? Three dollars and five dollars. Three dollars and win and minus five dollars. So my question is, how can I change the rules of this game uniformly so the game is fair? So you say, okay, why don't we do the following? Why don't we add R to each of these, that's changing the rules. And now let's compute the, the new expected value. It would be uh, the three plus R times four sevenths plus um, minus five plus R times three sevens. These guys all want to sell me contracts for my car. Okay. Now, if I work this out, notice what happens. I get um, I get three times four sevenths minus five times three sevenths. And then I get plus R times four sevenths plus three sevenths. And by the way, this of course is one. So the expected value turns out to be exactly the answer I got before, which was always minus three sevenths plus R. Is that what I got minus three sevenths? Well, yeah. So if I want this game to be fair, I should change the payoffs by, um, by minus three sevenths of a dollar. Now, this is indicative of, 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 a, of a result. Notice, um, suppose we have the random variable x, and x has expectation e of x. So now suppose I change x into y, where y is just a times x plus b. That is, I. I I modify the random variable by a linear transformation, linear change. 
So what is P of Y? That's the question. Now, remember, E of X is defined to be the sum over all possible values, say, of X of I times P of X of I. So now if I replace X by AX plus B, meaning I multiply every X payoff by, by A and then add B to it, this would then turn out to be a x sub i plus b times p of x sub i. Now we all know about sigma notation from calculus. I can rewrite this as a times summation x sub i p of x sub i plus b times p of x sub i. What is the sum of all the probability going to equal to? That's going to be one. So this term is going to be plus B. And this term right here is just E of X sub I, or E of X rather. So I've just proven that E of AX plus B is just A times E of X plus B. Look at the special case when A is one. Then this would just be E of X plus B. Now, does this make sense? Well, let's suppose X represented the scores on an exam. Then E of X would represent the class average. Now, what if I, it, what if I um, curved the exam and I gave everybody B points? Well, then the class average goes from E of X to e of x plus b. You've increased the whole class average by the same amount. So that's an important observation about the expected value. Now, here's a, I want to tell you another property about the expected value that I haven't proven yet, and I'll prove in the, uh, one of the, uh, I think it's either the next section or the section after that. Namely, let's suppose we have two random variables, x and y. Okay? Then we're going to show that e of x plus y is actually equal to e of x plus e of y. I haven't proven this yet. I'll give you a, a simple example in a second. Similarly, if I had n random variables, the expectation of the sum would be the sum of the random variables. I haven't proven those results yet, but I might need them uh, down the road. And in fact, more generally, if I had E of say, A1X1 plus A2X2 and so on, I will show you soon enough that this is equal to A1 times E of X1. And by the way, I can throw a B in here plus, as well, plus B plus A2, E of X2, and so on, A sub N, E of X sub N, plus B. I'll illustrate this in a couple of moments. So uh, expectation is, is often called a measure of a, of a central tendency. It's one of the measures used in statistics it gives you some information about your distribution. It tells you at least what the average value of your distribution is in some sense, where by average, I mean, each outcome is, is weighted by its probability. But uh, I can rig up an example where I can have two classes, uh, two, two different, well, here, let's suppose I have two different classes, okay? And let me plot um, the grade distribution. Let's say I had, uh, in the first class, um, I have uh, 10 students who get an 80. I got 
15 students, forget a 90. I got 10 students, we got a, uh, uh, a 60. And I get 15 students who get a, a 50. Well, notice I rigged up this distribution that if, we, if you want to figure out the class average here, the class average is a 70. Everyone follow that? If you average up all these uh, 30, 50 students, it would be a 70. Now, suppose I had another class where I'm going to get the exact same average. Uh, oops. What happened? Sorry about that, folks. 60. And let's suppose I had five students here, five students here, um, 10 students here, 10 students here, and let's suppose I had 15 students here. This class would also have an average of 70 if you worked it out. But notice the spread of the students is different about their mean. In one case, um, my concentration looks like the first picture. In the second case, uh, it, it's a little different. The grades are spread out differently over a different range. So we, want to, we need a measure that gives us the, the spread or the cluster about the mean. So, because it's possible to have one or more distributions that have the same mean, but they're very, very different. The students are, in one case, all they have, the class average may be clustered around 70. That is the real tight distribution. Whereas in the other case, you may have a class average of 70, but they can be spread out between the grades of 20 and 100. So you have a very different spread. So we need a measure of the spread about the mean. So, um, and you might say, well, why don't we just look at X minus mu and define that, but notice what will this always be? What value will this always turn out to be? E of X minus mu. If I wanted to find this as a measure of the spread around the mean, x minus mu says x is the observation of the grades they got, mu is the class average. So x minus mu represents the spread about the mean. Well, this is bad for two reasons. Firstly, if we just use a property I just gave you, this is equal to zero because those above and those beneath, the signs may cancel. So this certainly is not a good, a good measure of the spread around the mean. So somebody might say, well, what about this measure? Well, this measure, while it might be useful, it has bad mathematical properties. In fact, some books use this as a measure, but there are certain properties that, especially when we get to continuous distribution, that this doesn't satisfy well. So what we do is we define the following. We define what's called a variance. Uh, I don't even remember what note take I use V or V to bar. V, okay. We're gonna define the variance of the distribution, V of X. Uh, some books, by the way, write V of V A R of X. We define the variance to be the following. Uh, look at x minus mu squared, and let's take e of x. And by the way, another name for variance of the random variable s is sigma sub x squared. 
Again, when the random variable is understood, I'll leave off the subscript. So sigma, by the way, which is called the standard deviation, sigma is defined to be the square root of the variance. Okay. So what? So notice, by the way, in units, if whatever unit x is measured in, e of x is measured in the same unit. For example, suppose um, suppose the x sub i represent the weights uh, somebody's weight. Okay, their weights. I don't mean a, like eighty-seven pounds. Or kilograms, okay? Then E of X would also be measured in pounds, same units. Because remember, the way you get E of X is you take the, the X's and you multiply them by probabilities. Probabilities are a unitless quantity. V of X would be measured in pounds squared in units, but sigma sub X would just be in pounds. So the variance essentially measures, it looks at the, it looks at the mean and it compares it to all the observations, all the X's, and it gives you the average of all those squared. Now I wanna make an observation. So we have one definition for variance. It's equal to E of X minus U Squared. Now remember, e of anything, e of your grandmother, is defined to be summation of y sub i, uh, p of y sub i. So in particular, e of x minus mu quantity squared would just turn out to be x sub i minus mu squared times p of x sub i. So given a discrete random variable, one can actually, and I'll, I'll do an example in a couple of moments, um, one can fairly easily compute this number. But I want to show you there's, a, there's another uh, an, an equivalent formulation. E of x minus mu squared is equal to e of x squared minus um, 2 mu x plus mu squared. If we now use the properties of the expected value, the ex expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. Remember, mu is a constant. And we can bring out these. So we get a simple, simple house ring. I'm just using multiplication. Remember, E of X is another name for mu. So I get E of X squared is equal to, I'm sorry, uh, I get this is equal to E of X squared. minus two mu squared plus mu squared, or I've just proven that E of, uh, I've just proven that the variance, another formulation is E of X squared minus mu squared. So the variance remember was defined to be E of X minus mu squared. But that's also equal to E of X squared minus mu squared. And in, or X of I squared P of X of I times minus mu squared is another formulation.
So let's consider an example or two just to illustrate this. And by the way, you should observe from the definition of variance. Let's let's go up a little bit, okay? If I look at this formulation of the variance, look what it says to understand what it means physically. If the variance is small, remember this is the variance. If the variance is small, then one of two things is happening. X sub i minus u is small. That is, this sum has to be small, which means each term is small, which means if a somehow there's a big variation between the mean and, and the observation, the x sub i, then its probability that that happens is very small. Or this is small with a large probability, it's going to be small as well. So this really is telling us the concentration how concentrated this distribution is. If mu is near x sub i, this, this will be very small. If mu is away from it, it'll be large. So let's walk through a couple of examples, okay? Uh, so let's suppose we have the following distribution. I'll take this right from the text. So let's suppose I have minus two, zero, three, five, and 0 0.12, 0 0.48, 0 0.25, and 0.15. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is compute the mean. The mean is minus two times 0.12, plus zero times 0.48, plus three times 0.25, plus five times 0.15. And this tells me the mean turned out to be 1.26. Okay, so next I wanna compute E of X squared. Because I wanna use a formulation E of X squared minus mu squared, I'll use this version, is equal to the variance. So let me add another line to the table. Let me put x sub i squared on my table. So this would be 4, 0, 9, 25. So e of x sub i squared would just be the x sub i squared times the probabilities, which would turn out to be 4 times 0.12 plus 0 times 0.48 plus 9 times 0.25 plus 25 times 0.15. So that gives me E of X squared is equal to, I've already done the calculation, E of X squared is equal to um, 6.48. So V of X is 6.48 minus the mean squared. And that turns out to be, uh, what does it turn out to be? 4.8924. And if I want to find sigma, it would be the square root of that. And that would be equal to 2.2, roughly. Okay. So there's an example where uh, um, I found variance. So notice I could have instead, notice what I did is I computed the x sub i's. Then I computed the x sub i squared. And we had the p of x sub i's. So I computed E of X squared, firstly. And I computed mu. And then I use a formulation that the variance is E of X squared minus mu squared. I could have done it longhand, 
not that it's so long either, is I could have set up my table with following x sub i, then compute x sub i minus mu, and then compute x sub i minus mu quantity squared, and sum all these up, multiply by the probabilities. It would have been long-winded. It would have taken longer to do. So uh, I think the, first, the second method I use is, is preferred. So again, we define the variance to be E of X minus mu quantity squared. We showed that that's equal to about sigma squared equal. And that's equal to E of X squared minus mu squared. Okay. So consider the following problem. I could have sworn at this point. Okay. They keep wanting to sell me car insurance or, or car repairs or something. Suppose I toss a die, okay? And let's look what could happen. If I toss a die, I get a one through six, right? And the probability of any of these happening is one six. So the mean is one times one six plus two times one six up to six times one six. Okay, and what does that turn out to be? Uh, n times n plus n plus n plus one. Uh, oh, is that right? So uh, one plus two is three. Three and three is six. Six, twelve, tw twenty-one over six. Did I do that right? Twenty-one over six. Three goes seven. Yeah. Okay. Well, assuming I did this right, this is uh, seven over two. Did I do that in this section? Is that in the next section? Yeah, okay. Now, suppose I want to compute the variance. So, what I need is x of i squared, right? This would be one, this would be four, this would be nine. This would be 16, this would be 25, this would be 36. So E of X squared would be one times one six plus four times one six plus nine times one six and so on. 36 times one six. And if we do that calculation, um, I believe we get 91 over six, which means um, V of X would be 91 over six minus seven over two squared. Remember it's E of X squared minus the mean squared. And that turns out to be um, 35 over 12. Okay, now I want to show you something really cool. So I figured if I toss a die, if I toss a die on the average, uh, if you toss a single die, you would expect to get uh, this, the, uh, the average, this, the, a three and a half, right? Seven and a half. And its variance is 35 over 12. And if you wanted a standard deviation, that would be the square root of 35 over 12. So now let's change the problem. Suppose I toss a pair of dice, again, a pair of dice. Um, and we want uh, X is equal to the, the sum. 
And we know the sums go from one uh, from one to, uh, from two to twelve. Uh, let's call this y to be different, okay? Let's find the sum. Determine the uh, e of y and v of y. Now you can do this problem two ways. You can write out all the possible sums. Uh, two, three, up to 12. Remember, to get a two, you need a one and a two, and a two and a, to get a, a two, you need a one and a one. To get a 12, you need a six and a six. To get an eight, you need a three, five, four, four, five, three, six, two, and two, six. And then compute all the probabilities. But there's a really nifty way. Let x1 be uh, the number on the first side. And x2 be the number that shows on the second die. Okay. Then y would just be x1 plus x2. And by the way, x1 and x2 are the same. Notice x1, we just did. And similarly, V1 and V uh, and X2, we know, because it's the same thing. Because the dice are being done independently. So E of Y, the expected sum would just be E of X1 plus E of X2. We know that's true because the expectation of a sum is a sum of the expectation. That's something we're going to prove soon enough. So I get seven halves plus seven halves, which is seven. So on the average, you expect the sum to be seven. V of Y, we don't know yet. We, I'm going to talk about that right now. It turns out, by the way, in this case, it's going to be the sum of the two variances because they're independent events. So um, let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, properties of variance. So the first question is, what is V of X plus a constant? Well, remember with the First, I can prove it to you without it doing any work, just by talking, I hope. V of X represents basically the spread of the distribution around the mean. So now, if, think, if picture a, a, a histogram in your head. So we have the distribution. Now, let's suppose we add the same number to every X value. Effectively, what's happening is you're taking the whole distribution, and if I add a number C to every value, I'm moving the entire distribution, C units to the right or C units to the left, depending on the sign of C. But everything else is remaining intact, which means the distribution around the mean, the mean will have changed, but, but the distribution around the mean is exactly the same. So this must be V of X. Now, how can I prove that if I want to prove it mathematically? In fact, let's suppose. I want to be even more general. Notice in uh, if I said A equal to one and B equal to C, it's, it's, it's above. So if I prove this result, I will have proven a little bit more. Well, remember V of Y, I could write as E of Y squared minus the mean mu or E of Y, So y in this case is ax plus b. So this would be e of ax plus b squared minus e of ax plus b squared. So let's write this out a little bit. This will give me e of just algebra now a squared x squared plus 
CABX plus B squared minus E of AX plus B squared A squared E of X squared plus 2AB E of X. I'm just using the properties of expected value now, plus B squared minus um, A E of X plus B squared. Let me just look at this term by itself. I get A squared E of X squared plus 2AB E of X plus B squared. Notice, um, I lost something here. Uh, what, what did I lose? X. What happened here? I'm trying to find it. I think I made an error and I'm trying to locate it. Ah, oh, hold on, hold on. H there's a squared. There's an error here. Let me just clean this up. I can't, uh, I want to find my error. Let me clean this up for you. I think I was a little bit too sloppy. My apologies. Okay, I'm computing V of Y, remember, where Y is AX plus B. And that's equal to E of Y squared minus E of Y times B squared. So now I'm going to let Y be AX plus B. That's equal to E of AX plus B squared minus E of, oh, I see my mistake, AX plus B squared. That's equal to E of A squared X squared plus 2AB E of X plus B squared minus a E of X plus B squared. Let me make sure I didn't make a mistake there. So here I get A E of X plus B. Okay, and I got a square that. So I have A squared E of X squared plus two A B E of X plus B squared minus A squared E of X squared plus two AB E of X plus B squared. Okay, now notice this term and this term cancel. This term cancels. So what do I have here? I have a squared times e of x squared minus e of x quantity squared. I see where I made my mistake now. This, by definition, is v of x. So I've just proven The result. Okay. So I've just proven the following. I've just proven that um, V of AX 
plus b is equal to a squared v of x. And it follows that um, v of x plus a constant is just v of x. So we have these properties of vary. OK, so let me backtrack a little bit. So we know the following. We know that e of ax plus b is just equal to e of ae of x plus b. Special case, of course, if a is equal to 0, e of b is equal to, to b. We also know that e of ax plus by plus c, this one we haven't proven yet, just turns out to be e of a of e of x plus b of e of y plus c. And this will generalize, of course. We have uh, v of x is um, e of x minus mu squared which we can also write as e of x squared minus e of x quantity squared. What else do we know? We, um, we've proven the results above about the variance. And here's the following, which we need to prove. If x and y are independent, v of x plus y equals v of x plus v of y. So let me, let me look at a more general case, and you'll see where this comes from. Let's consider v of ax plus by. Remember, v of anything, say v of w, is e of w squared minus e of w quantity squared. So if I replace w by ax plus by, I get the following. I get e of ax plus by squared minus e of ax plus by squared. So what does that give me? Oops. That gives me the following. It gives me um, e of a squared x squared plus 2ab xy plus b squared y squared minus um, a e x plus b e y squared. Let's look at this term by itself. This is going to give me a squared e of x squared plus 2ab e of x e of y plus b squared e of y squared. So let's see what we have. Let's put things together now. This term is going to give me a squared e of x squared. minus this term, which is a squared e of x quantity squared. Then I'm going to get this term, which is 2ab e of, I lost my question here, uh, e of xy. And this term is minus 2ab e of x e of y. 
plus b squared e of y squared minus b squared. Oops, I got it backwards. Let's go. E of y squared. And finally, I have a squared times e of x squared minus e of y squared plus 2ab e of x y minus e of x e of y plus b squared times e of y squared minus e of y quantity squared. Notice I've just shown the following, b of ax plus by is equal to a squared. Now, this term right here is, this is an x, uh, is v of x. This term right here is v of y plus 2ab e of x y minus e of x e of y. Interesting result. So look what it says in particular. Well, firstly, so v of ax plus by is nothing more than a squared v of x plus b squared v of y plus 2ab e of xy minus e of x e of y. Now, I for one don't like formulas, but this one's useful. Now, let's look at the special case when a equals b equals 1. Then we just get v of x plus y is equal to v of x plus v of y plus 2ab e of xy minus e of x e of y. So notice v of x plus y is not equal to v of x plus v of y. In general, that's not the case. I did all this work just to prove this. Now, firstly, I want to make a remark. If we look at this term right here, that's this term up here. If we look at this term, this term has an E, which we'll talk about a little later. It's called the covariance, by the way. Uh, it's called, some people call it covariance of X and Y. Sometimes the symbol for that is sigma sub X, Y. But notice that's in the expression for V of X plus Y. So V of X plus Y has in it V of X, plus v of y plus 2ab times this new term, which we'll call the covariance of x and y. So v of x will, plus y won't equal to vx, v of x plus v of y only when this covariance term is zero. So we need to talk about that a little later on. I'm going to show the following in the next section. When x and y are independent, then the covariance of x, y is zero, i.e. e of x, y equals e of x times e of y. And that means in that case, and only that case, will this be true?
Where am I? So I have, what I've done in the last couple of minutes is just talk about some of the properties of expected value and variance. So we have these properties, okay? I summarized them, by the way, at the end of this section. But we need, but so we need to understand that, hey, this will always be V of X, which is nice. We need to, we, we have these so-called linearity properties of expectation in all cases. Uh, variance will be linear only when uh, all the, all the uh, events are independent. In fact, we're gonna show at one point if, what about this result? I mean, I, I don't have enough time to do these now. What will this turn out to be? Or simply speaking, Under what conditions will this equal to V of X plus V of Y plus V of Z? So these are the things we need to talk about. Now, I haven't quite finished the material in this section. This is section where, what section is this? Uh, I think it's 2.7. There are a couple of examples in the text that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, and I need to talk about um, um, standardizing random variables. So I'd like you to do the homework in section 2.7. You should be able to do most of them right now. Um, I'll talk about the law of the, uh, of the uh, unconscious statistician as well. Uh, you'll find them there. But I'm sort of in the middle of an idea and I need about another 15, 20 minutes to finish it. And I can't do that now. So typically, if you have a problem like this, you, if you can't assume, well, what you can assume is this is true. Because moving by constant, translation by constant is invariant. But you can't assume this. Unless X and Y are independent random variables. So you'll see there's some exercises where we have to work all this out, where we need to compute E of X, Y minus E of X, E of Y. This will be need to be computed. And we'll do that on, uh, what's today? Today is Wednesday. Uh, we'll do that on Monday. So please do the homework uh, in this section and I'll pick up on it uh, the next time.